keeps surfing the two. This little creature keeps appearing in the pictures. So, like, is this a natural landscape in the background? No, no. It just looks like that. Yeah, I actually shot it this way. Oh, wow. And then when I turned it, I saw that scene. Wow, man. Sunset in Cyber Valley. What are we looking at? A photograph that I took. It's a three-second exposure okay. with no manipulation afterwards whatsoever. This is a snapshot as it appeared in the camera. And I call the series Dancing with Light. And where are we? Where are we in? It seems like this is like some kind of sanctuary. This is like a. Where did I take these? Yeah. No. Where? Where? Where is this? Oh, this is the uh, Chamber of Sacred Vinyl in Roger Steffen's Reggae Archives. And uh, it represents, gosh, 60 years of record collecting and 41 years of reggae collecting. Wow. I got turned on to reggae in 1973. Um, and uh, Country Man was on the cover, only they called him Country Man in those days. And it was an article about reggae, a wild sign of paradise. And it's the first time I ever heard the term reggae or heard about Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley and Duke Reed and Cox and Dodd and all the early pioneers of the music. So was this just your awakening or were people at the time like well, finally being introduced to it? The harder they come had just come out. And the soundtrack and Bob's first American album, Catch a Fire. And the writer was a gonzo journalist from Australia named Michael Thomas. <clears throat> and he said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. <laughs> and I said, I have no idea what that means, but I gotta find it right now. And I was living in Berkeley and I ran out. I found a used copy of Catch a Fire, the one with the, light, the Zippo lighter cover, uh, for two and a quarter. Figured I could take a chance and fell in love with it from the first notes of the music, Concrete Jungle. And uh, the next night I saw The Harder They Come in a little tiny theater on the north side of Berkeley with. 40 people jammed into it and the uh, spliff scene came on where everybody was smoking chalice and everybody in the theater lit up and you couldn't see the screen for all the smoke <laughs> in the theater. And on the way home I bought the Heart of They Come soundtrack and my life changed forever from, from those two moments. Wow. Yeah, and now it's seven rooms, floor to ceiling of our house. And this particular room has uh, most of the vinyl. It's the defining collection of Bob Murray. Um, this is the Bob Marley and the Whaler shelf here, and uh, from here over, these are things that I wrote liner notes for, or took the cover pictures of, or produced, and box sets that I wrote down here, um, and reggae and African. I've always been into African music since the 1950s when Olatunji came to America, and. Michael Babatunde Olatunji was the first person I ever interviewed on the radio back in 1961 in New York, and we were friends throughout his life. And Fela Kuti was a friend as well. This is the album he did in 1970 in Nigeria with Ginger Baker from Cream, and it is autographed by Ginger and Fela. And most all my uh, Fela albums are signed. This shows him with several of his 27 wives. And when he got out of prison in 86, I had him on my TV show, and he wore nothing but a pair of purple bikini <laughs> underpants for the TV interview. And I said, fella, you must have been so glad to get out of prison and come home to your 27 wives. And fella said, oh no, when I get out of prison, I divorce them all. <laughs> I said, why? He says, oh, marriage is too confining. <laughs> There's a picture of him down here. Yeah. Here he is with Sandra Isidore, the woman who turned him on to black consciousness back in 69 when he came to play in jazz clubs. Yeah. And my wife Mary and Fella, that was in uh, 86. Yeah, she's, Sandra's amazing, actually. I met her once. Sandra's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, 
I mean, am I not? Please. I'm only asking him things out of curiosity, but that's well, beautiful. Ask me anything. Ask anything, because we already have the we already have the paper, which will be somewhat later. So ask anything. He is an encyclopedia of information. So I'm just curious, like. Before you were introduced to reggae, like, who were you? What were you doing? Like, has music always been a part of your yeah, life? Yeah, I was 12 and when why? Alan Freed, the king of rock and roll, this man, came to New York uh, from Ohio. And he's the guy who coined the term rock and roll. And in Cleveland in 1952, he threw the first so-called rock and roll dance. And he put it in a place that held 4,000 people and he sold 20,000 tickets. And there was a riot from all the people who couldn't get in. It was the first rock and roll show and the first rock and roll riot. And it made headlines. That's genius. <laughs> yeah. And that's why the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is in Cleveland, because that's where the first rock show was. And he was my hero. He came to New York in August of 1954, revolutionized radio in New York because of his rock and roll show. Three radio stations within a month had completely changed their formats to rock and roll. Hmm. And uh, he used to throw these massive shows with uh, 20, 25 acts uh, for 250. My first rock and roll show, I'll show you here. This is the program from my first rock and roll show in 1957. Fats Domino, Teenage Everly Brothers, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, Thurston Harris and the Sharps, all these people. All those people, and a movie for two fifty, and and Fats Domino and Jerry Lee Lewis back to back. That was insane. And then the next year, I saw two more with Jackie Wilson, and Chuck Berry, and Bo Diddley, and Bill Haley, and they, they were amazing shows. This is a picture his son gave me of him at his home in Connecticut, with reading his fan mail. They have no idea how huge this guy was. Everybody in the New York area listened wow. to him. And he changed my life. I met him several times. I told him once I wanted to be Alan Freed when I grew up. <laughs> and I had been called the Alan Freed of reggae. So That's that good. was kind of a trip. Yeah. And we are dis you're discovering this area, like just like, like the way I did a couple I of months so ago. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, because if you think, like, I think, who was, what country wanted to, like, Maybe get it from you, and then but they, they well, won't. Well, Jamaica's try, tried to buy it several times, but they won't guarantee to keep it intact. Yeah. And so I've spent 41 years yeah. putting this collection together. It is the definitive collection of Jamaican cultural history. Why do you think they don't want to do when that? When you say keep it intact, you mean yeah. keep the whole entire collection yeah. together as one piece? Because it's not just records. It's it's not just videos. It, it's it's 1,500 t-shirts. It's 3,000 buttons. Right. It's uh, yeah. it's statues. It's paintings. It's the collections of things inspired uh, there's, by you. Yeah, there, there's probably 140 cubic feet of clippings. And 3,000 books and magazines from all over the world. And everything illustrates everything else. It's, it's a gestalt. And, and in order to understand what Marley accomplished, you have to understand the whole field of reggae music, going back to the ska era. And I don't want any of this broken apart. It would be a crime. And I could see it all on eBay in six months, you know. Yeah. So I'm not willing to let it go. I, I'm not. I don't want to sell it just for the sake of selling it. I've turned down a lot of people over the years because the deals just weren't right. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually it, it should be institutionalized. My bottom line is that it be kept intact and that it be made available to the public w while respecting all That's the rights fair. of the artists. But it's history, and, and Jam Jamaica really should have it. Jam right. It belongs in Jamaica, but if they're not willing to, to keep it intact, I'm not, I'm not going to let them near it. Yeah. I owe too much responsibility to people. As I get older, the, the sad part of all this is uh, people die and leave me their own collections. And in this case, these are the master tapes recorded by my friend Jeff Cooper, who was one of the chief audio engineers at NBC Television. And he was a reggae freak, and he would come for seven years in a row, from 82 to 88, to the Sunsplash Festival in Jamaica, the big four-night mm -hmm. festival. And he would <clears throat> borrow 
$10,000 worth of NBC's most precious sound equipment and come and sit in the mud and the rain right in front of the soundboard for four days and nights and never leave the place. And he recorded master tapes of impeccable quality wow. of every note of Sunsplash from 1982 to 1988. These are the master tapes in all these boxes here. These are digitized versions of them that he did. And when he passed away, he left me his archive. So I feel a great responsibility to people who've done that, especially to make sure that it does end up with the rest of these things in a place where, where people can make proper use of it and, and um, historians will have it. You know, one of the saddest stories of my life was when Bunny Whaler asked me to co-write his autobiography with him and my friend Leroy Pearson and I went to Kingston and spent three weeks locked in a hotel room with him. And we played every record the Whalers ever made and got the full story of who was on it, where it was done, all the things you need to do a college textbook discography, which was published eventually in, 19, uh, in 2005. And um, the transcriptions of the 64 hours of interviews came out to 1,800 pages. Okay. And, they filled, that for us. <laughs> and they filled this box here. And Bunny refuses to publish the book. Why? Uh, he feels intimidated by the Marleys, and uh, he knows all the dirt. I, I mean, was going to say, are there things you have to say that maybe others wouldn't be so keen about? Precisely. Hmm. He's, he was raised as Bob's brother. Bob's mother moved in with Bunny's father when Bunny was eight and Bob was 11. And no one knows that story like Bunny. Yeah, and these are the Marley singles. This is all Bob Marley, and this is his handwriting on the label, according to his best friend, Skill Cole. And this is his rarest record. I paid $1,800 for this. This is Selassie as the Chapel. There were only 26 copies pressed. I wrote this song and gave Bob Marley to sing, 1968, Mortimer Planner. And this is the copy of the record that I played on the day Bob Marley passed, May 11, 81, on the JBC, Dermot Hussey who is one of the people who runs the Sirius XM channel, reggae channel. And this is the original pressing of Natty Dread, and you can see how they spelled it, Naughty. Naughty. <laughs> and um, this is autographed by Bob. So I'll show you a funny story. This is small axe. If you are the big tree, we are the small axe. Big tree meant the three big record companies. They say tree instead of three in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So, And um, I asked the upsetter, Lee Perry, Scratch, who produced it, to sign the record. And he says, I upset her write this song. I am the small axe. Bob was not even there when I wrote this song. Turns out he didn't write it. Bob wrote it. <laughs> signed by Peter Tosh and, and uh, Bunny Whaler and Family Man Barrett and Reggie Lewis, who was one of the members of the Upsetters at the time. So that's a precious record. And but this is not a reggae story, but it's an interesting story. The most legendary album that never came out from the 60s was called Smile by the Beach Boys. And Brian Wilson wrote a bunch of the songs with a poet um, named Van Dyke Parks. So he was here a couple of months ago, and I showed him that record that Lee Perry signed. And then I asked him to sign the first pressing of the Smile album from the 60s. And he signed it. I wrote this song. Brian wasn't in the room. <laughs> Sincerely, Van Dyke Parks. <laughs> so this is all uh, Bob. This is Coxon, Waylon Solom, Upsetter, Tough Gong, Tough Gong, Tough Gong. This is Bunny. That's Peter. This is the kids, Damien, Julian, Ziggy, Stephen, Kimani, the I-3, and the Whalers Band. So it is the defining collection of all of the Whalers works. This is an early pressing of the jacket for Rastamon Vibration where they hadn't printed the lyrics yet and the back cover is blank. 
And the, the interesting thing about the collection is about 40% of all the records are signed. And a lot of those people are gone now. Right. I was on the air here for 10 years on the NPR station on KCRW. And I always brought all the records by the artists when they came on to do interviews and had them sign everything. And uh, that makes them special. They've been touched. And, and often I ask the artist if there's a story about a particular album or song to write write a little bit about what the story is or identify the people on the album cover itself. And that, that's been a lot of fun to, to work that because out. because you get each person's version of the story. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're, 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 I wrote the song. They weren't mm -hmm. even here. My, my next book is uh, an oral history of Bob Marley from Norton. should be out by the end of the year. And the epigraph at the beginning is, there are no facts in Jamaica only versions. <laughs> and there's the, another one from an old comedian who's still alive, he's in his 90s, called Professor Irwin Corey, who dresses like a mad Einstein in a lab coat and crazy hair. And He's a double talk guy and he says, this may not be the truth, but let us use it as a fact. <laughs> Words to live by. Awesome. And, and what what's in, I feel like there's a, there's a room that's somewhat darker and more in, there's, a, there's something. Uh, Come with me to the Cosba. Yes. <laughs> and close this. We have some room. Yes. All right. In, in our, the left here, I'm not supposed to bring anybody in there because it's such a mess, but that's the reggae cave and that's a storeroom and there's 1,500 t-shirts in there and you know, thousands of other things in boxes. This is a hand-painted beaded curtain from Saigon, and I spent 26 months there during the war. So that has a lot of resonance for me on two levels at least. <laughs> and this... Very careful. This is the reggae library. And these are some of the books I've written here, the discography in the bottom. Watch your head. So uh, this is all reggae print in here. These are reggae magazines arranged alphabetically and then chronologically within each title. Big section of Japanese magazines. I bought the first issue of Rolling Stone the day before I went to Vietnam in November of 67. And I subscribed immediately, so I've got a full 47-year run of Rolling Stone. Wow. And boxes and, as I say, there's 140 cubic feet of clippings. All well, these drawers are filled with the clippings. There's a box filled to the brim with Fella Cootie clippings, Bunny Whaler, Peter Tosh, Ziggy Marley, and these are five boxes of interviews I've done with people and uh, reviews of the one-man show that I do called The Life of Bob Marley in, in all of these boxes. And then on the left are some of the 2,000 huge posters, banners, and there's about 30,000 flyers and smaller posters. And that's another picture I took of Bob when I was traveling with him for a couple of weeks in 79 on the survival tour. <laughs> so watch your step as you go down. This is my first movie. I played uh, Richard Widmark's assistant in Roller Coaster in 1976, and I jammed the bomb in the last reel and saved George Siegel's life. <laughs> this is interesting. This was a cover for a 12-inch of Jaw Live that never got pressed, and that's the biggest show of Bob's life. 110,000 people in a soccer stadium in Milan in June of 80. That's the soundboard. The stage was way down there. And when Keith Richards oh was goodness. here... I showed this to him and I said, 110,000 people came to see Bob Marley. And Keith says, well, I suppose that's all well and good. In Rio, we drew two million. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Bob Marley's white grandmother and her brother, Hugh. And uh, that's 100 years ago, and they had black blood in them already in those days. That's the white Marley family. They also had a long, long history of melanoma, which is mm -hmm. what eventually took Bob's life. And this isn't reggae, but it's one of my treasures. This is Frankie Lyman's autograph in 1955. Oh. Oh, boy, this is like... 
here's one of my favorite pictures of Bob. This was taken by Tony Bernard, and that was taken in uh, 1973 after Bunny quit the group and Joe Higgs, their original teacher, replaced him briefly. So Bob, Joe, Family Man, Carly, Peter Tosh, and Waya, just before Peter quit the group too. Mm -hmm. That was taken on Santa Monica Boulevard in West L.A. How long were they here for? During this period? A week. That's when the mm -hmm. uh, film at the Capitol Records Tower was shot. The rehearsal session wow. was shot. Yeah. What was the experience like dealing with uh, Bob? What was Bob Molly's experience like when he first came here and like was being promoted and found out his music was being appreciated? Oh, I think it was a revelation for him. Uh, he was disappointed by it because all the audiences were white. Mm -hmm. And he wanted more than anything to reach the African-American audience. And they pretty much stayed clear of him. Mm -hmm till he died. He was going to do a national tour with Stevie Wonder. He actually came back at the end of the summer of 1980, having played gigantic stadiums to 100,000 people and more in Europe. And he came back as opening act for Lionel Richie and the wow. Commodores at Madison Square Garden. That's insane. And when his opening set finished, half the audience got up and walked out. Oh, really? <laughs> Lionel was not a happy fellow. <laughs> yeah. My friend Bruce Talaman, uh, we did a book called Bob Marley's Spirit Dancer together, uh, was the only photographer that brought, Bob brought to Africa with him. In January of 80, Bob was uh, taken to Gabon. And one morning he's walking along the beach, and this young fellow comes up to him one morning, and he says, what's this? Rasta stuff. What do you mean coming to Africa telling us about Africa? And just as Bob started to answer, Bruce took that picture. That's my favorite picture of Bob. I just, I love the humanity of it. And these are buttons from all over the world. These big ones are 12 tribes buttons from Orange County in Southern California. <laughs> all these Selassie buttons here. These are things that I've collected over the past 40 years. And these are all Bob Morelli buttons, every one of these. And one of the great days of my life was finding a picture I took of Bob and Family Man bootlegged on a button in Kingston. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor to be bootlegged in Jamaica. Mm. <laughs> and these buttons, I have a lot by uh, Pa Glenn. The ones with the red, gold, and green borders around them are actually made in Bob Marley's yard in Trenchtown today wow. by the son of... Uh, the man they call Tartar. You see him in a lot of the documentaries. He has no bottom half. He's in a wheelchair. Mm. And he's the one who supposedly wrote No Woman, No Cry. Wow. So his son, Poglen, makes these buttons. I've got hundreds of his buttons. Wow. And there's wacky stuff here, too. This was a custom pair of Nike sneakers that were made for me. Awesome. They said they'd make them for me if I would wear them when I emceed concerts. <laughs> and uh, in the back room, there's thousands of hours of live shows that I uh, emceed over the years with the board tapes of them. So, let's leave the reggae decompression chamber. These buttons, the top half, I found in 2001. And uh, I put the word out two years later when I went back to Kingston that I wanted to meet the man who made them called Bobo Ricky. And he shows up at the hotel one night with a coat hanger hanging off his shirt collar and 224 buttons on a banner. And uh, I took one look at him, and I said, I want them all. Oh, wow, and he kept it. So I bought them. Yeah, that's what wow. he was wearing that night. Yeah. So much work goes into these. He says, yeah. are you going to sell these? I said, no, man, I'm going to put these in a museum so people 100 years from now see your work, because it's, it's the best. I love his stuff. Yeah, yeah Bobo Ricky and... Pod line of my favorite button makers. But let's awesome. go into the reggae vault. So these are more of, of Pod Glenn's buttons. These I got just a few weeks ago. As I say, they're made in Bob Marley's yard. And that's the picture that I took of Bob that he's made buttons out of this one. And, uh, these I found in Seattle. There's a white roster group up there. Of course there is. <laughs> yeah. And they make these. And this I found in 1981 at Sunsplash. They're coconut shell buttons made by Shaper from Roaring River. There's Joe Higgs and uh, Junior Marvin and Carly Barrett and Bunny Whaler and the Whalers. 
Seco <laughs> little coconut shell buttons. All right, so this is the oops, this is the uh, temporary reggae vault, and here's Ola Tunji, the great Nigerian yeah. drummer. And he was the first person I ever interviewed on the radio back in 61, and I found this in Big Sur last year. We used to teach at the Esalen Institute. Mm -hmm. That was a story about touring for two months uh, in the winter a year ago as the opening act for the Whalers Band on their survival revival tour. I showed pictures that I took when I was traveling with them in 79 on the original tour. And, explained the lyrics of the album and the importance of it, and then they'd come out on stage and play the album live. Mm. So we did uh, two months together. I was sleeping on the floor of the bus with two guys over me. <laughs> and here's one of the real treasures. You know the war speech that Bob said to music? Mm -hmm. um, this is the day that Haile Selassie made the war speech to the United Nations on October 4th, 1963, and this envelope was postmarked on that day at the UN and signed by Haile Selassie and his signature confirmed by his secretary in the Imperial Palace. I had 24 hours to come up with a thousand dollars cash to get this. <laughs> and this is the day I met Bob in 1978 and three uh, nights later they were uh, going to do a show. Yeah, let me get here so you get yeah. the proper light on it. <laughs> In, uh, on July 18th, 78, Bob did a show in Santa Cruz, a couple of shows, and there was somebody uh, out front handing these posters out to promote the show three nights later at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. And Junior Marvin took us backstage to meet the band, my wife and I. And uh, that night, Bob signed it. Seco, Family Man, Tyrone, Waya, Carly, Al and Junior. <laughs> and then it took me 14 years to get everybody else, but there's 28 people on the front. His mother, his sister, Joe Higgs. I always saved this corner for Peter Tosh, but Peter would never sign it. <laughs> Me not sign the Blood Club Bob Marley poster. So. <laughs> Marcia, Rita, Judy, uh, Ziggy and his brothers and sisters, Chris Blackwell, uh, Danny Sims, Bunny Whaler. Don Taylor, the manager, Skill Cole, his best friend, Neville Garrick, mm -hmm. and then 10 more in the, no, 11 more in the back. Recently I had Errol Brown, Bob's mixing engineer here, and he signed the back for me. And this is a very important record. It was Prince Buster's first. It's known generally as the first Jamaican record. And it's O Carolina by the Folks Brothers. And this was autographed by John Folks, who wrote the song. Mm -hmm. And when the Queen Mary mounted an exhibition of my archives in 2001 for eight months, they took about 6,000 things out of the house and framed them. And then there was a big catalog printed from that. And these were two-page spreads. These were Selassie buttons and Bob Marley buttons. And then Bob signed this to me, and Neville Garrick and the family man. You can see up here. And these are all Selassie buttons here. And I've got another thousand or so sitting in a drawer. And this is a treasure. This is the first pressing of The Harder They Come. And it's signed by Perry Hensel, the director, and Chris Blackwell, Toots Hibbert, Jimmy Cliff, and Desmond Decker, the stars of the film. And next to it, the man that introduced me to Jamaican music a long time ago, in 1954, when he had the first million-selling album, Harry Belafonte, oh, Calypso, he signed that for me. I narrated his Lifetime Achievement Award at the Grammys, and I said, I always wanted to ask you something, how come you never recorded any reggae? <laughs> and he said, oh, I thought about that. He said, well, I always wanted to be a little ahead of the curve, whatever the curve was at the time. And when Jimmy Cliff and Desmond Decker started to make their breakthrough, I didn't want it to look like I was trying to steal their you thunder. <laughs> but can you imagine if he had recorded yeah. a, a cover of Rivers of Babylon in 1968? 
he could have broken reggae five years earlier in America. Yeah. Interesting. That's a painting given to me by Carlos Santana. And that's a painting that became an album cover. That's the original painting there of the upsetter as Vishnu or Shiva. <laughs> And these are buttons uh, on the top half. Those are buttons I found in 2001 by Poglen with the distinctive red, gold, and green surround. Mm -hmm. Now come down from the top left to the third row. You see John Wayne, Tony Curtis. There's also a Gregory Peck. Yeah. And they're all black rappers from Kingston. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, Gregory Peck. <laughs> And that was the most recent piece in the exhibition uh, at the Queen Mary, which opened in January of 2001. And this was the month before in South Africa. And the first show was in Cape Town in a shopping center called Century City, <laughs> which is what I look out on from my balcony here. <laughs> Babylon by bus was a bus poster in London. This is from Poland, an anti-apartheid solidarity human rights concert. They paid the performers with potatoes. Wow. And uh, that side over there are the whalers in Israel. Wow. And uh, these paintings are done right on the surface of the record. Wow. That was from the picture. I took a bomb on the left there. Hmm. So, this is a, one of my treasures. I was the national promotions director of Island Records in the early 80s, and one of my projects was King Sonny Ade, and this is signed by him and the entire 18 members of his band. I became particularly close to Demola Adepoju, who played the steel guitar. How was that? Well, what, what would you say about those uh, this artist back in the day? It seemed like oh, I met had, a lot of them, you know? I had a pile of tear sheets in my office, like two feet tall, from the rave reviews that right. he was getting selling out the Greek theater and everything, playing juju music. Right. Uh, he was destined to be, you know, someone on a, on a level of Marley. And then at the last second, Chris Blackwell dropped him from the label and withdrew all support wow. after the uh, Synchro System album came out. Wow. I don't to this day understand the thinking behind that. Hmm. But, you know, I've been in love with uh, Nigerian music forever. Mm -hmm. and uh, African music since the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, I did an album with Miriam Makeba, an okay. interview album for Sangoma. And, uh, but I loved Victor Uifo and a lot of the early artists. And then the, the reggae bands, well, come on out here. The, uh, this is the catalog for the Queen Mary exhibition. And we had an international section and I just, I love the, the names of the groups from Nigeria. Um, musical power and the root vibrations. Mm -hmm. uh, Rossman Maxwell Udo and his Masses Militia Band. And uh, Free World Hoodlums and Evie Edna. Exempts E and the Trinity. These are the free world movements and the mandators and Victor Essie has become a dear friend of mine and he's doing a show in Nigeria in October and he's bringing me over there to do three oh, shows. Awesome. My first time ever in sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, Had to wait 72 years well to do deserved. that. Well deserved. Yeah. That's going to be fun and I may be going to Zambia for three shows too. And uh, you know, it's such a universal form of music that everywhere you go you find people making reggae because it's, it's protest music. The beat of reggae is the beat of the healthy human heart at rest. So that's its secret. Even people who don't understand the language are viscerally attracted to it because of that heartbeat. And when Keith Richards was here, he says, well, you know, um, I think the, uh, the beat of the healthy human heart is 72 beats per minute, but the Rastas play slightly less than that. Mm -hmm. like, 71 beats per minute. I don't know how he figured that out, but that's what <laughs> Keith claimed. All right, so come on in here. We haven't been in the, uh, the reggae reception chamber over here. Yeah. So I, I did a television show for 23 years, a cable show called L.A. Reggae, and a lot of the tapes in here are the master tapes from the show we had. 
a lot of the, the really big artists, uh, not just reggae but African on that show too. Mm -hmm. and there's a couple of thousand reggae business cards. My favorite, see if we can get tight on this, is Gregory Isaacs who says he is a producer and distributor of phonograph records. <laughs> <laughs> Making him a pornographer. <laughs> have you digitized these? You All the Marley stuff? stuff has been digitized. But there's 14,000 hours of cassettes and 2,000 hours of video that I have neither the time nor the energy to do. So whoever takes some of the collection is going to have to. Yeah. Well, I don't want to give it away until somebody takes the archive. Right. Because that makes it less valuable. So if it's out there for free, you right. know. So, this is what I did instead of buying stocks and bonds. Like, I don't <laughs> something to my kids. Um, this is all reggae. I'm pretty sure it's very valuable. That's all reggae. This is African. Uh, these are reggae anthologies. And these are movies that I've been in, or narrated. I made my living as an actor most of my life. And that was a picture taken by Glenn LaFerman. Uh, shortly after I was traveling with Bob, he took these in the first week in December of 1979 for a Playboy interview that never appeared. Oh. And uh, he called me a few years ago and I turned him on to the Marley marketers and they bought his entire archive of pictures and he retired. Wow. <laughs> so he gave me a couple of uh, blow-ups to thank me. That's cool. And this one and there's another one in the front room. So these are interesting. I, I, I shot film uh, from 93 to 2007. These are beautiful. And I shot a lot of on-purpose double exposures, except for this one. This is Bolly Reed, who succeeded Neville Garrick as the art director of Tough Gun. And this is a drawing he made of Brother Georgie, who made the firelight in No Woman, mm -hmm. No Cry. Mm -hmm. So I shot his face, and then I shot his drawing over it. And that's what happened. Everything matched with the noses. Wow. Oh. That's at a Jackson Pollock exhibition with the Night Nurse, a reggae DJ in New York. Mm -hmm. And this is all done on film? All on film. You never know what it's going to look like until yeah. you get it back. Mm -hmm. That's the best part. That's Mary and her sister. That's our daughter, Katie. Here's Carlos and Bunny. Oh. This is Vivian Goldman, who wrote an extraordinary book on the making of Exodus, and she was one of Bob's close friends in the 70s in England. And one day she took Bob back to her apartment, and she said Bob paid her the greatest compliment of her life. He said, you know, Vivian, you don't have to smoke herb all the time. <laughs> Bob Marley told me I smoked a bit. <laughs> These are all on purpose. No, 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 and then there's 13 huge drawers filled to the brim of chronologically arranged Bob Marley clippings and press releases and photographs and so forth. Yeah. This is a huge undertaking. Yeah, I ne you know, I never set out to do this. It just happens. Why is this? Oh, okay, sorry. Let me show you a couple of things here on the wall. Um, here's Robert Marley Jr. and Zinga Garvey, Marcus Garvey's granddaughter. And Donovan, the old mellow yellow guy, he came to visit. And this is Perry Hensel who made The Harder They Come. And Solomon Burke. And here's our daughter Katie with Timothy Leary, the LSD guru, just before Tim died. That was his last business card. <laughs> And here's uh, Tartar in the wheelchair with no bottom half, and me and Mortimer Planner at a lecture I did on Peter Tosh's life. No, actually, Bob Marley show. And this is a shot I took of Bunny and Aspen 10,000 feet up in the Rockies under a double rainbow 20 years ago. And this is the only medieval reggae poster I've ever found. Um, it's again from the shipyards in Poland. I was going to say it's in Poland. Yeah. Wow. And that, uh, that's a, you know, crop of the picture that I took of Bob. And it's been bootlegged all over the world. A rug maker in Taiwan named Yo-Yo made a rug out of it. <laughs> Yo-Yo the rug maker. And that was in Guam where we did a show and six shows in Israel. 
We played a Rasta kibbutz in the middle of the Negev desert with guys with yarmulkes and dreadlocks. <laughs> and all the latest singles from Jamaica in a red, gold, and green pub six nights a week with Ras Hootie at the controls. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a poster for the six shows we did in Israel. That's a sarong from Bali. And the four buttons on the left there were made in Shashamani in Ethiopia, in the part of the country that Selassie gave to repatriating Rasta. And there's two posters there from a tour of the Hawaiian Islands. Welcome. Well, I, my first question is, like, why is this your life for? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> my wife has asked me that more than once. It just... It's nothing I ever set out to do. It just happened. I mean, one thing led to another. Uh, uh, hearing that Marley album uh, and seeing the harder they come led to my interest in finding the music. And there was a record store in San Francisco on, on Fillmore Street called Trenchtown Records, run by an old friend of Bob's. And I was able to find really good rudical music right from the start. Uh, Count Ossi and the Mystic Revelation of Rastafari and Ras Michael and the Sons of Negus and the Techniques and Alton Ellis and the great rock steady music. And then in 76, Mary and I went to Jamaica and we arrived at Kingston and within two minutes one of the biggest stars at the time was picking my pocket in Bob Marley's record shop. <laughs> Welcome to Jamaica. And then uh, in 78 I met a guy in town uh, here, uh, Hank Holmes, who had about 8,000 Jamaican records and had never left L.A. in his life. Wow. And he had a tremendous knowledge of the subject and a phenomenal collection. And I figured, well, there's no reggae radio show on the air in L.A. We could do a great show. And we tried for a year to get on the air. KPFK, the great liberal bastion, gave us three audition shows that went really well and finally said, well, we can't in good conscience put you on the radio playing reggae because you're white. Mm. Interesting. Talk about reverse racism. <laughs> so they lost that show and we went to this little station on the west side called KCRW, which had great plans to grow, but at that time had 110 watts and the signal hit the San Diego freeway and died. And we made so much money for that station that they were able to become a major powerhouse for NPR and put transmitters up that cover from Santa Barbara to the Mexican border out to Palm Springs and our show was the biggest uh, weekly money earner for, for that station. The first fund drive we, we did in three hours we made what the station had made in ten days previously. So our show uh, was given four hours a week on Sunday afternoons, and it was like church. Everybody in the city listened in the 80s. You could walk, in the summertime, you could walk down the beach in, in Santa Monica. You didn't need a radio with you, because everybody on the beach was playing the reggae beat. And um, in 1980, I started a TV show with a Trinidadian drummer named Chili Charles. That went for 23 years. In 82, C.C. Smith and I started the what became The Beat magazine that ran for 27 years. And in 1984, uh, I started um, a video presentation called The Life of Bob Marley at the National Video Festival. Got great reviews for that and started getting requests from uh, theaters and clubs and colleges to do the same thing. And that's how the life of Bob Marley was born. I show a couple of hours of unreleased footage and tell his life story in between the clips. And it's always changing because I'm always learning new things. Mm -hmm. And I've since published six books about Bob and reggae and I've just finished my magnum opus, a 12-year project of an oral history of Bob Marley with my interviews with him and about a hundred of the people closest to him. You know, not putting Timothy White like made up words into people's mouths. It's people telling their own story in their own words. The raw material of history, all arranged by subject matter and periods in Bob's life. And uh, I worked on that for 12 years and I just finished it a couple of weeks ago. Why do you think that's so important for people to be able to see? Because there's so much contradiction. You know, just finding out uh, 
after the audition for Cox and when did they record Simmer Down? People's memories are so different. Coxon says it was weeks later. Bunny Whaler says it was the next morning. <laughs> they were both there. I don't know. How do you believe? How do you know what to believe? And that's why I wanted to do this book. This book I want to be the standard work because all the different first-hand participants in major moments in Bob's life, almost all of those people are represented in this book telling their story in their own words. So if you took out like the contradictions or just the the very like specific details that people that are just rely on people's memories, like what's the common thread that remains the same? Well, just that everybody exposed to Bob found him to be an extraordinary individual. Uh, the thing that fascinates me is his psychic abilities. I uncovered a lot of people who who had experiences where Bob read their palms or told them intimate things about their lives that he couldn't possibly know, even doing that as early as three and a half years of age, mm -hmm. you know, with the local constable out in the, in the bush where he was raised and an older woman. And, uh, and there was a, a novelist in uh, Jamaica in the 70s who said the day he met Bob, Bob just sat down with him and told him all about his life. And he was completely blown away because everything Bob told him was true. This is somebody he never met before. Um, Bob had a gift. He told two young people in Delaware in 1969, where his mother had married a guy in 63, uh, that he was going to die at 36. He was 24 years old at the time. That's not the kind of thing kids talk about. And he did. He died at 36. So <clears throat> he had the power, he had the gift. You look at the back of uh, Rastaman Vibration where he has the quote from the Bible about Joseph. He identified as the Joseph of the Bible who fed the children of Israel for seven years in the desert. This time he had a seven year international career, 73 to 80, bringing spiritual food to the world. And you know, on the back of it he said, uh, he quoted the Bible, the archers of sorely tempted him and, and shot at him. And a few months later, the assassins came to murder him. So that was seen as a prophecy. And after the shooting attempt, he went from showman to shaman. He was looked at in a whole different light. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. It answers I just, it. Um, I, I, I feel a duty to the truth because there's so much bull out there, so many miscon... Oh, Bob Marley died because he smoked too much dope. Or Bob Marley was always stoned and he couldn't do anything. I mean, look at the body of work this guy did, the hundreds of songs he wrote that are now international anthems to people all over the world, all of it inspired by Herb. When, when the millennium came, the New York Times said that Bob Marley was the most influential musician of the second half of the 20th century. First half was Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Both daily herb smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> How did you, like, like, why do you love music? Or what was your first, when did you like music? Well, well, probably much earlier than that. I, mean, I'm, I don't know, I must have been black before this. <laughs> I must have been. When I was a little Irish Catholic kid growing up in North Jersey, on Sunday mornings, I would listen to those scratchy black stations down at the end of the AM dial that were broadcasting gospel music from churches in Newark and Harlem. I just loved that. And, you know, hurry up, you're going to be late for Mass. <laughs> Screw Mass, man. I want to hear Mahalia Jackson. <laughs> there was something about black music that just got to the Ink Spots and the Mills Brothers when I was really little in the 40s. And then Freed came to New York in 1954 playing the blackest music. And then there was a, he was on from 7 to 10 every night. And, and then there was a guy down on the black end of the dial named Jocko Henderson, who followed from midnight, from 10 to midnight. And he, he was even black. He was black. He was even blacker in his playlist than Freed. And, and, you know, everybody thinks rap is something new. This guy's rap. Every kid in New York City in the 1950s could do Jocko. <clears throat> but in 
Away up here in the stratosphere, you gotta holler loud and clear. E tiddly ock. Uh oh, this is the jock, and I'm back on the scene with my record machine saying, ooh, pop a doo, and how do you do? Ready for your race into outer space? Look a poo all through. Later, Gator, got a cut. <laughs> but if you just said the first two words, everybody would join in with you and then do the whole rap. And, uh, you know, I, I was immersed in music that stirred my soul. And then at midnight was Symphony Sid, this whiskey-voiced old white guy who had a jazz show. And I was reading Kerouac. And uh, I figured, you know, all these beatniks love jazz, so I guess someday I'm going to love jazz too. So I exposed myself to it. And um, I went to the Village Gate because you could you'd go to the nightclubs at 18 in New York and uh, drink. <laughs> and I, I, I saw Ola Tunji and Miriam McCabe and Herbie Mann and Dave Brubeck and, you know, amazing jazz artists in, in the early days, too. And I particularly loved the African music. It, it's visceral. I, I don't know how to explain it in an intellectual way. I didn't want to listen to Vaughn Monroe and Patti Page and Perry Como. That music was bland and insipid and, and said nothing. I loved harmonies. And then in the 60s, the consciousness came into the music, the Dylans and the, yeah. the poets and the singer-songwriters. And um, when the lawyers and the accountants took over the music business in 70, 71 and basically destroyed it, uh, a lot of old hippies like me were looking for something to reignite our passion. And when I heard reggae in 1973 for the first time, there were the harmonies I loved because they were listening to doo-wop too. But there was consciousness. There was an elevation of the music that was calling us to a higher purpose. And no one did it better than Bob. He was such an exquisite poet. I was making my living for many years uh, doing a one-man show called Poetry for People Who Hate Poetry. And I was on a school circuit from September to May, a different city every week. And it was the poetry of Catch a Fire, even before the music or, or the beat that got to me. His, his way uh, of dismantling the capitalist experience and putting it into a couplet. You know, good God, this illiteracy is just a machine to make money. You know, keep people ignorant. And you can pay them 17 cents an hour to make Nikes in Indonesia. Right. Yeah. So that, that became a cause for me, and I, I wanted to spread it. Whenever I, I come across something I like, I like to share it with my friends. My first guest was Bob Marley. We started with Bob Island Records, called Hank Holmes and me, and said, would you mind going on the road for two weeks with Bob Marley? Oh, man. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know who the happiest guy on the tour was? The bus driver. <laughs> you know why? Because he smoked him out all the time. <laughs> well, not so much that, but your clothes. Because he, he got to sweep up all the roaches at the end of each tip. <laughs> Sometimes he... He'd go home with two, three or four ounces, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wanted to be Bob's driver. <laughs> oh, man, that's hilarious. So do you think, in a sense, then, like, documenting and collecting and sharing and, like, broadcasting this has been, in a way, like, your response or your sort of, yeah, your response to that call to action? Oh, absolutely, it yeah. became my mission. For some reason, I found myself in the center of this. I was asked to create the Reggae Grammy Committee in 1984. I was chairman for 27 years. And, uh, you know, all the, all the places it's brought me and my wife Mary doing the, the Marley Show to the, the bottom of the Grand Canyon where the Havasupai Indians live, who believe that Bob Marley is the reincarnation of Chief Red Cloud returned to Earth as a black man to lead the red man forward to his freedom. In Kathmandu, they believe he's a, he's a reincarnation of Vishnu. The, the, the Maori people in New Zealand uh, gave him a title, Redeemer. The Aboriginal people in Australia revere him as a god. They have a radio station at Uluru, the Red Rock in the middle of the outback, uh, that plays Marley constantly. He's their hero. Third world people, First Nation people. Uh, 
Bob is their representative. And I, I quote this at the end of my Marley shows because uh, it's such a beautiful thing. Uh, John Pirelli's is the chief pop critic for the LA, uh, for the New York Times. And uh, in 1996, the New York Times Sunday Magazine celebrated its 100th anniversary of publication. And they asked each of their critics to choose one work of art that they felt would survive for 100 years into the future. And John Pirelli's chose Burnin, the last album that Bunny, Bob, and Peter made together. And he wrote these words. He said, Bob Marley became the voice of third world pain and resistance, the sufferer in the concrete jungle who would not be denied forever. Outsiders everywhere heard his voice as their own. If he could make himself heard, so could they without compromise. In 2096, when the former third world has overrun and colonized the former superpowers, Bob Marley will be commemorated as a saint. And I believe that to be true. Was he a saint, you know. Saints are, are, are very human people. Right. I'm not saying he was perfect, he wasn't. But so much of what he did and committed his life to was saintly. He never had a home of his own. Never. He wow. bought probably three dozen houses for other people. He supported 6,000 people a month. And I know that because his business manager, Colin Leslie, is a very close friend and he had to sign the checks or they weren't valid. And he told me that Bob supported at least 6,000 people a month whose very survival depended upon help from Bob Marley. This is not a common man. This is not your run-of-the-mill rock star. He says, my only purpose in life is to help others. And he meant that and he lived that. And he was worthy of emulation and he wrote some of the most magnificent poetry of our lifetimes and set an example for centuries to come. As long as people are suffering, they're going to sing Bob's songs of redemption. Right. It's going to give them inspiration. Is, is there something in the in this kind of like um, message of uplifting people who are suffering that resonates to your own personal life at all? Oh yeah, I, I mean I got drafted and sent to Vietnam in 67 and I was there a couple of months before the Tet Offensive and after that broke out the city was filled with refugees and on my street in downtown Saigon there were huge uh, sewer pipes that hadn't been laid yet and there were 52 families living in sewer pipes. And I wrote to uh, some friends of mine in the states and areas where I had done my poetry show in the schools and where I was pretty well known. And one of the towns, Racine, Wisconsin, adopted me. And they, paper published an editorial urging support or some kind of assistance and three weeks later two five-ton trucks pulled into our compound in Saigon with my mail. Ten thousand pounds of little packages all addressed to me and I went into the colonel and I said sir you gotta come out and see something. He says Private Steffens I'm very busy. I said Colonel you gotta come out and see this and one of the huge connexes was open and the boxes were spilling out of it and the colonel says, well, what the hell's that? And I, I said, well, that's my mail. <laughs> what is it? And I said, well, it's refugee supplies, I guess, for my friends in the States and I'm going to send them all back. What do you mean? I said, well, I'm so busy working for you as your personal typist, I don't have time to distribute them to the refugees and I promised my friends if they sent me food and clothing and stuff that I would personally distribute them so make sure that they don't end up on the black market. Come into my office. Next day I had a promotion to spec for. I had my own Quonset hut. I could go write my own plane ticket anywhere from the DMZ <laughs> to the Delta and work on any project in Vietnam that I thought worthwhile. As long, he said, as I took pictures. And that's how I learned to be a photographer. I had free film and developing for the next uh, two years. And uh, I spent 26 months in Vietnam uh, working with refugees. Never fired a shot, thank God.
But I survived the Tet Offensive. They burned our whole block to the ground on Ho Chi Minh's birthday, dropped three rockets on us. And, um, and I got to help people. I got to build villages and bring medical and dental assistance to people. And um, I guess I had that, you know, bleeding heart liberal. <laughs> My ex-conservative friends might call me. Because <laughs> I went over there as a Goldwater conservative. Really? Yeah, what an idiot. And I was there for about three weeks when I saw what was going on and I realized, no, nah, my whole life I've been fed a bunch of lies. It was so wrong, that war. So wrong. What was the first, do you remember what the first time it was that you had that feeling? Probably when I walked into the barracks they assigned us to and the whole front uh, room of the barracks was lined with uh, slot machines. And um, in, in the neighboring barracks, uh, the, the lobby had um, pretty young women in short skirts selling Ferraris and uh, insurance and stereo equipment. I mean, the, the American corporations made out like bandits in Vietnam. Wow. It was a commercial venture, and I was appalled. And then I started to read reports in the States of things that I had seen firsthand myself and how they were being reported in Time magazine and others. They were just lies, just complete falsifications. And I was true. Well, I'll tell you when it happened. It was before I went to Vietnam. I. Uh, I got drafted and I signed up for an extra year so I didn't have to go to Vietnam, according to them, uh, and, and they would put me in radio and TV because that was my background. Instead, as soon as I got finished with basic training, they sent me off to a, a fort in Indianapolis to be a stenographer. I said, screw this. It turned out to be the same small fort where the Defense Information School was, which was the school that I should have been sent to. And I arranged to transfer into it, and they had it was a 13-week course in radio and television broadcasting, the best training I've ever had in my life. With the edge that at the <laughs> end of each week, if you didn't pass your tests, you got sent back to your unit and shipped off to Nam. So um, I was to go, and this is ironic, my first orders at the end of the radio TV school were to go to Asmara, Eritrea, mm -hmm. Ethiopia. I had my shots, had my visa, and the last week of class, everybody's orders were canceled, and we were shipped off en masse to the JFK Special Warfare Center, run by the Green Berets in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to have three weeks of intensive indoctrination in PSYOPs, Psychological Operations, which was the modern title for propaganda warfare. And they trained us the first class, four-hour uncut version of Lenny Reifenstahl's Tri Triumph of the Will, the Nuremberg Nazi film, the four-hour uncut version. The last day, the last class was another four-hour re-showing of Triumph of the Will. Now go to Vietnam and emulate this. They trained us with Nazi films. Wait, what was the rest of the training like? Oh, how to put the, how to soften up uh, an audience and uh, how to float ideas without giving away what you really intended to do. Mm -hmm. You know, psyops, how, how they infiltrated a country. When we invaded Grenada, the first people they set in there were, were the psyops teams. They blew up the local radio station, put their own station on and broadcast these propaganda things. Oh, the good Americans are coming to save you from these terrible Cubans building this airport for you. So that was a shock. Mm. I'm being trained by Nazi films. What the wow. hell is really going on here? So I came back and I wrote a book about it that never came out because nobody wanted to read about Vietnam in 70 anymore. I just was invited to the University of Wisconsin in Madison in last October uh, to talk about Vietnam. And uh, they have a class called Vietnam music, media, and mayhem. Mm. And they saw an article, uh, an essay I wrote about Jimi Hendrix in Vietnam and the influence of his music and traced me somehow and 
brought me out to speak about, about Vietnam. And uh, you know, Wisconsin was where the refugee supplies came from, so it was kind of full circle. Yeah, it was a terrible, terrible war, and I don't think we've had a just war since. So, the minute that you came home, what did you... I lectured against the war for a year, back and forth across the country, wrote the book. Uh, and I reread the book to uh, prepare for this class that I did last October, and some of it holds up really well. And I, uh, I had... And sublimated a lot of stuff. I was in a lot more danger than I ever remembered I was. But this was like a diary, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I did. I, I repressed a lot of it when I came home. But I, I was able because uh, people knew me as a Goldwater conservative before I went to Nam, and I was able to speak to a lot of right-wing groups that never in a million years would have had an anti-war speaker. Mm -hmm. oh. And I would come in and I'd say, look, all I'm going to do, I'm going to show you pictures I took, I'm going to tell you what I saw personally, and uh, why I came home feeling the way I do now. And the Republican Women's Club of Davenport, Iowa, and the Lutheran Layman's League in Illinois, and yeah, you know, those were hot and heavy times. And then, all of a sudden, beginning of May of 70, the whole country goes on strike. All the colleges go on strike because of the murders at Kent State and Jackson mm -hmm. State. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about Kent State, but they don't talk about Jackson State. There were two students murdered there, too, but they were black, so it didn't count. <laughs> now, it really makes me angry that people forgot that. Mm -hmm. And so I was no longer the convocation speaker. I was the strike committee speaker. And some of those things lasted three or four hours and got very hot and heavy. Not everybody was anti-war even then, and uh, I was accused of being a communist and a dupe of foreign forces. And, yeah. and at the end of the year, when I finished the book, I just didn't want to be an American anymore. Nixon was still in power, and they were still fighting the war. And I moved to Marrakesh, to the Medina. <laughs> Lived in the heart of Marrakesh for most of 1971 and discovered I was an American. So I came home <laughs> for 41 years. Has been Ricky, day and night, eating, sleeping, talking. <laughs> uh, our kids were born at home with reggae playing. <laughs> Katie came out to Burning Spear. Devin came out to Bob. His, his middle name is, is Marley, my son. Um, it's I who gives you the right. You reveal who you are in your criticism, and if a lot of people think you're full of it, they're not going to read you. Mm -hmm. And if they don't read you, they're not going to buy your magazine. So, I guess they liked what we did with the magazine. Everybody seems to miss it now. You know, but we could have used a little more support, especially toward the end. You know. What about your wife and kids? Have they just been along for the ride? Does she have a genuine love for it too? Oh, or has can she you developed imagine, it because of you? Can you imagine living with me in that <laughs> life in Oregon? <laughs> now Mary's a Berkeley girl. She went to Berkeley in the 60s. She okay. was That's tear, all you had to say. Tear gassed in, in, in People's Park and then tear gassed in Free Speech. And, you know, she's a, we met on an acid trip for God's sake. So, you know, this is, this is a, a kind of woman I, as an East Coaster, always hope to meet someday the ideal California girl. <laughs> and we met Bob together. We went to Jamaica together uh, countless times now. And uh, she loves the music. She's got, she's got very good taste in music. And uh, again, she was very interested in black culture growing up. She was born in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And so she she went to the Fillmore in the 60s, and I said, who'd you see? She says, everybody. I said, like who? She says, I don't know. <laughs> Which means she was really there, you know? <laughs> and, the, and the kids, you know, they, they, they kind of grudgingly came around. They have their own taste. Katie was the chief uh, uh, critic for Mog.com for a couple of years, the music blog site. And 
uh, she was a, a disc jockey. She had a, a thing with her boyfriend for a while called Lady Kate and Stone. She was a sound system at Footsie's over in <laughs> Highland Park, all vinyl. Uh, and it's um, soul, funk, reggae, and African music, but all vinyl, mostly wow. 60s and 70s. So I did my job. <laughs>